Um, behind me, uh, there should be some slides. And I just want to deliver a brief message before I introduce Gina Pallara, who I, whose recruitment I regard as the sig single signal accomplishment of the past year. Um, and let's have a round of applause for that. And before she, 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 she introduces uh, Bill Van Hoevel, who, who I must confess, conflict of interest here, hired me for my first job ever um, a long time ago. Uh, but it, it was unpaid. Um, so the, uh, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about MAS's mission and the problems that are facing uh, the city. This is a picture of Paris, not of New York. And I want to tell you a brief anecdote uh, that has to do with the very ugly building in the middle there, which is the ugliest building in Paris. And that's the Tour Montparnasse. Um, and that single building, to my knowledge, is the only such building in Paris, and it defaces Paris um, uh, to the extent that there's now a movement to tear it down. And yes, here, here. Um, a week ago, and my son is a witness because he's been working with me, uh, a French investor came into my office, because when I'm not here at MAS, I, I run a private equity fund. A French investor came in interested in investing in my private equity fund. And he handed me his card. And he's not the actual investor. He represents the investor. He works for the, for the family that, that uh, uh, has the money. And um, I noticed on his business card the address was the Tour Montparnasse. And I said, I said something about the aesthetic judgment of, of, of having office space there. And uh, he said, well, actually, he said, the family that he represents built the tour Montparnasse. <laughs> and I said, I said, can I be frank? I mean, this is all in a good-natured conversation. I said, but I said, I really don't want your money. Uh, and he, he, he looked extremely surprised. And I said, I'm dead serious. I said. I say this in the nicest possible way, but I said, and I'm sure the people you work for are very nice people, but in my book, they're aesthetic criminals. And they've defaced one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And he said, well, we're moving out. And I said, well, good. I said, but he said, he said actually, he said, they're quite proud of it. And I said, well, all the worse. And I said, look, I said, it's four years until we're open again. I said, you've got lots of time. He said, we're moving out in two. I said, fine. I said, come back to me. I said, if you come back to me and tell me that your family has joined the movement to tear it down, I said, we'll talk. I said, otherwise, there's nothing to talk about. And I'd like to see a little more of that in New York. Is, is, Um, the wheels don't connect here. Um, people can build whatever they want, and there are no consequences to it whatsoever. The society and, 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 the, and what the society lives in are not, are not related to one another. So let's go to the next slide. And this won't be too long. So we, we did an exercise in seeing what the ultimate expansion of chain store life would do to the retail environment, and took a look at Bryant Park, um, uh, overwhelmed by CVS, TD, and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We even took it larger and said, maybe this is what Central Park will look like, the ultimate chaining of New York. Um, the, uh, um, we are in serious discussions with these institutions about why it is necessary to do this. I had an extremely interesting conversation with the former head of retail banking at one of the biggest banks in the world about why the branch below me in my office at TD is empty all the time. And he said, because they make no money there. He said, because if you're a TD banker, you can't get any business on a loan unless people see the bank. So it's not a business. It's basically a large ad. And we want to have a dialogue with these institutions about why they need to advertise in an architectural form that is despoiling the city. Um, and why does CVS need to advertise that way? If they were in Vienna, they would have to submit themselves to the landscape of the city. Let's go to the next slide. Preservation remains a major tenet of, of, of what MAS does. The Crown Building is not landmarked. 
let's go to the, it's, 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 it, the, the Roosevelt Hotel is not landmark. This is the King's Theater in Brooklyn. It's fantastic. It's not landmarked. We are working to landmark these three buildings right now. They're not calendared either. The infrastructure in this city is a mess. Understandably so. We've been here for several hundred years. We haven't caught up. What you just saw was the, the gateway project. You see here the consequences of, 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 of flooding. Next slide. You'll see, you know, more, more, more. It's, it's actually a wonderful photograph of of, 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 of of infrastructure problems. Can we go to the next slide? We are working. We have a, a task forces on infrastructure. Penn Station. This is not Penn Station. Okay, <laughs> don't be mistaken. Okay, in your dreams. Okay, okay. This is Union Station in Washington D.C. Okay, okay. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is. I mean, this is Philadelphia. That's Union Station in Philadelphia. This is, I believe, uh, Union Station in Cincinnati. Thank you. Cincinnati. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So even Cincinnati is much better set up than we are. OK? The next one, I think, is LA. Yes, there's LA. Again, uh, it's got a very LA look, better than, better than we are. OK? Um, and then. Could we have the next slide, please? On the left, you see what we had. On the right, you see what we do have. And this is what we're trying to fix. And so we're deeply engaged with the governor, with all the powers that be, in trying to move that thing, that ugly thing that is sitting there, squashing Penn Station, Madison Square Garden, to a wonderful site where there a wonderful new Madison Square Garden can be built and a new, wonderful new Penn Station can be built. Next slide, please. This gives you a, a sort of before and after, uh, before on the left of what Penn Station looked like and what it looks like today. And again, this is one of our major, major tasks. This is a view, and this is the actual view of the skyline in 2010, looking south at Manhattan from, the, from, from a high vantage point at the north end of Central Park. This is what that view will look like from buildings that are planned and permitted now in 2023, in seven years. So welcome to Singapore. <laughs> this is the seaport. Kiss it goodbye if, the, if, 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 if what's going on right now succeeds. We're, we're, we're working very hard, and Gina's been working hard to succeed. This is, I think most of you have had lunch there. This was the Four Seasons. And on July 26th, the furniture is being auctioned by right because the owners have been shut out by the developer who owns that building. And that developer will, they own the furniture. They have no place to put it. And so uh, we've been in conversations with Wright trying to figure out what to do about it uh, to prevent all that Mies van der Rohe furniture from being dispersed forever. Um, and uh, we were able, working with uh, the powers that be, to join in the effort to save that room. Um, but it will never be the same. Next. Some good news. Some great new buildings. So this is the new path station. And I've, 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 I happen to have picked uh, two of our directors, our new directors. Um, just by circumstance. Next, next page, the wonderful new Lincoln Center lawn that Diller Scafidio Renfro did. And our last issue facing the city, which is uh, the next Sandy. Uh, and uh, uh, we're part of, uh, uh, this is a major, uh, uh, this is a problem. And, and since Gina's going to solve that, um, I'm going to introduce her right now, OK? Here comes Gina. Well, I don't know how I'm going to follow that, but thank you, Fred. Good evening and welcome. I'm thrilled to be here as the president of MAS, my first gala. And thank you. 
Thank you. On behalf of MAS, we're delighted that you are all here to celebrate with us. I want to thank my chairman, Fred, and the dedicated members of the Board of Directors for their enthusiasm in planning this event and for your inspiring leadership. It's an honor to work with all of you. Tonight, we should raise a glass in tribute to MAS's beloved President Emeritus, Fred Pappert, who passed away just two weeks ago. We will remember him as a man of indomitable spirit and endless humor, a leader who inspired us to take on the biggest challenges facing New York City and win, whatever the odds. So, to Fred. I also want to thank our terrific staff for all the hard work they do each day to carry that tradition forward and for the enormous effort they put into bringing tonight's event together. But most of all, I want to thank all of you for supporting this evening to celebrate a man who personifies our mission at MAS, a true prince of the city, William Vanden Heuvel. So Fred highlighted some of the city's current problems, and my job is to help MAS solve them. Um, we are living in a rapidly evolving city, and the velocity of that change feels unprecedented. Add to that the enormous pressures we face every day, a deficient transportation network, an ever-increasing population, exorbitant rents, the need to attract and keep workers and businesses, the loss of neighborhood shops and neighborhood character, super tall buildings going up as of right, the list goes on. Just this afternoon, a bill reached the floor of the State Senate that would remove the FAR cap on residential buildings without a breath of public debate. MAS is leading the charge to forestall this amendment until there has been sufficient review and debate. So our work is still cut out for us. It's been said that the city is civilization's greatest contribution to the world. Nature gave us fields and plants, but human ingenuity gave us cities. And it is only human agency that can improve them. MAS turns 125 in 2018. And over its long history, MAS has fought some of the greatest battles on behalf of the citizens of New York City. Effective advocacy is in the DNA of our organization. Advocacy and the deep conviction that great architecture and great cities fundamentally alter for the better the way we all live and relate to each other. Our central mission remains the same, to preserve the past and responsibly plan for the future. The city needs a watchdog, and the people of New York need an advocate. In case you're wondering what's at stake here, Take a look at the pledge cards on your table. Depending on your perspective, supporting MAS is relatively a bargain. Our work is critically important to building the future that New Yorkers deserve. As a nonprofit organization funded by the generosity of our donors, we ask you to please consider joining us as a year-round supporter with a gift to our annual fund. When MAS and Fred Pappert fought to save Grand Central Station, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis was by our side. As I was planning for this evening, I came across something Mrs. Onassis wrote, which I wanted to share with you. She said, is it not cruel to let our city die by degrees, stripped of all her proud monuments until there will be nothing left of her history and beauty to inspire our children? If they are not inspired by the past of our city, where will they find the strength to fight for her future? Americans care about their past, but for the short-term gain, they ignore it and tear down everything that matters. Maybe this is the time to take a stand, to reverse the tide, so we won't all end up in a uniform world of steel and glass boxes. These words continue to guide and energize us. They're remarkably relevant even today. Plato said that what is honored in a country will be cultivated there. Tonight is especially gratifying for me because we honor a man with whom I have worked closely 
and who shares with our former First Lady the conviction that history and beauty must be cultivated to inspire the next generation as well as our own. We believe there's strength in numbers. With your help, MAS will continue to be a voice for this amazing city we all call home. Thank you, and please enjoy your dinner. Good evening. I'm delighted to join Bill's family and friends as you honor him tonight with the Municipal Arts Society's Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Medal. Bill has been a wonderful friend to the Kennedy family over the years, and I know my mother would be thrilled that he is receiving the medal named in her honor tonight. Bill was one of my Uncle Bobby's closest aides in the Justice Department and went on to be one of his top advisors during his presidential campaign. My uncle of Teddy loved to tell the story about Bill from the 68 campaign that I know is the real reason why you invited me to join you tonight. One day after Bobby landed at the airport, the press was surprised to see Bill get off the plane and begin walking Bobby's dog, Brumus, along the tarmac. A New York Times reporter saw what was happening and went up to Bill and said, I remember the days when you were one of Wild Bill Donovan's youngest advisors and Robert Kennedy's most trusted uh, aides in the Justice Department. Now you're walking the dog. What's going on? And Bill said, it may look like a dog to you, but it looks like an embassy to me. I want to introduce you to my dog, Taishikan. Speaking to you from the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo, it means embassy in Japanese. So congratulations, Bill. But tonight, you're celebrating Bill's leadership in realizing Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island. Four Freedoms Park would not exist without Bill and his commitment to President Roosevelt's vision. This park is a great celebration of the four essential human freedoms freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Bill has worked to preserve and protect these freedoms throughout his entire career, from his work with Bill Donovan in Thailand to the International Rescue Committee, from his work with Uncle Bobby in the Justice Department to the United Nations. Bill Van and Heuvel was one of my mother's favorite people. They shared a love of New York and a belief that our history gives us the inspiration and the strength to fight for our future. Congratulations, Bill, on receiving the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Medal. There is no one more deserving. Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel delivered a message uh, for you, Bill, from the Governor Cuomo. Um, and he says, dear friends, it's a pleasure to send greetings to everyone gathered for the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Medal Presentation Gala. Uh, the Society tonight awards its most prestigious honor to William J. Vandenhuvel. For four decades, Mr. Vandenhuvel led the effort to memorialize President Franklin D. Roosevelt in New York City, which resulted in FDR Four Freedoms Park on the tip of Roosevelt Island with a glorious view of the United Nations. Mr. Vandenhuvel is the founder and chair emeritus of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute and the Four Freedoms Park Conservancy. On behalf of all New Yorkers, I commend William J. Vanden Heuvel. <laughs> and the light comes <laughs> on this special tribute in honor of his extraordinary lifetime of achievements. With warmest regards and best wishes for a memorable evening, Andrew Cuomo. So tonight, I have the privilege of speaking about Bill Vanden Heuvel, a man with whom I worked for seven and a half years. I had the honor to serve under him as executive director of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Park. Every, everyone who tries to build a New York City knows there are many obstacles to overcome. What Bill faced in seeing this project through to completion was a four-decade marathon dodging failing administrations, fiscal crises, and critical shortages of funding. But as, but as I discovered, once Bill is committed to a project, he is like the granite we used at the park. Difficult to move, remarkable in what it can withstand, amazing to behold. Everything about Bill is kind of supersized. His compassion is bottomless. 
His energy is endless, his, intelligent, his intellect dazzling, his amazing steadfastness in doing what is right, his superb diplomacy. I realize that Bill is our own super tall, a monumental citizen in every sense. My years with Bill were an education, a chance to see idealism in action tempered by brilliant strategy and a refusal to see no as anything but a pause in the conversation. Bill said of his good friend, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, Jackie renewed our commitment to tomorrow by preserving our history today. Well, so has Bill Vanden Heuvel. He is perhaps the single person most responsible for preserving the Roosevelt legacy. Four Freedoms Park is one of the most beautiful civic places in the city. It serves to promote the history of Roosevelt that Bill has so long championed and provides an important place for all of us to reflect upon it. It's so meaningful to me that tonight we honor a man who has done so much for New York. Dear Bill, <laughs> he's a wonderful man. Someone like Ambassador Vanden Heuvel, you know, comes along once in a generation. He has had an extraordinary impact both on the physical as well as the spiritual dimensions of New York City. He's a very, very funny man, and smart and smart as can be. He always wants things to be better. He has his place in history of the city and what he's done. The Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Award is given to a person that has made a great contribution to the city of New York, and I think Bill has done that in a number of ways. Bill has been active on all sorts of different fronts, on racial justice, on prison reform, on the United Nations. It was close to Robert Kennedy, was asked by the Kennedys to supervise the change in the Prince Edward County schools in Virginia that remained a bastion of segregation. And Bill went there and was able to turn that around. President Carter appointed Bill as United States Ambassador to the UN in Geneva, and after a couple of years, Bill came to New York as the Deputy the United States Ambassador to the UN here in Turtle Bay. He's a humanist, he's a progressive, he's a person who believes in, in change, but within the traditions of American life. Bill has literally devoted his whole life to promoting and projecting the legacy of FDR and social justice. But the crowning glory is definitely the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Park. It's hard to build anything in New York City, but building a memorial designed by Louis Kahn in the middle of the East River, in the middle of a recession, is obviously an enormous undertaking that probably could never be done by anybody except Bill Vanden Heuvel. The 28 columns that make up the room, they weigh 36 tons each. They're too big to bring over the bridge. We had to barge them up the river. This is the biggest stone project in New York City, perhaps ever. The four freedoms that FDR enunciated were very clear. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom to worship God in one's own way, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And when you think about it, if everyone in the world had those four essential human freedoms, they would want for nothing. Well, it represents something which it's easy to be cynical about. There has to be something that is a rudder keeps the ship on course, and this represents that to me. What do I love about this park? I love that it's so serene. I love that it's so contemplative, but I love that it's Khan, and I love that it's Franklin Roosevelt. I, I just love coming up those stairs, looking down the lawn, and seeing that alley of trees. To me, it's, that's the awe moment of the park you come through those trees and you come into this room and the horizon opens up in front of you, suddenly you're really confronted by your own freedom, which is very much, I mean, this is the Four Freedoms Park. We are a nation of free people, and this experience of freedom that you get in this memorial really is a responsibility. I think my father and Bill have a similar understanding of the importance of words. Bill realized that by building this memorial, 
those words would really mean something. And my father realized it too in the sense that you don't see words on the walls. You see words as you turn to go. You take them with you. This was the vision of Franklin Roosevelt to say, and now we have to create that for the whole world. I believe that th this message, together with the extraordinary beauty of the project that's going to be created, be a world monument. And to have the four freedoms as a theme is really so wonderful. It was the first time a, a world leader had ever spoken in those terms. And you can't imagine how that ignited the world's imagination. These are the freedoms that are the foundation stone of America. Let them be the foundation stone of the world, too. That's what Roosevelt intended. Bill literally spent half of his life on this single mission. And it is a lasting, permanent gift to the city. And to have gotten this built at this time, a time when we truly need that message, it's a great, great gift to New York, to America, to the world. Sick of hearing from me. I just want to um, also acknowledge that uh, Jane Gregory Rubin and Reed Rubin are here tonight with us, and they were very, very essential in funding the exhibition that started this whole project up again. So I just want to make that thank you. And now it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, legendary newscaster, activist, and friend of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, Bill Moyers. From the earliest days of the Peace Corps to the Great Society Projects to the founding of PBS and NPR, Bill was witness to and instrumental in some of the most revolutionary projects of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. When he left government service in 1967, he quickly rose to become one of the most respected journalists in American broadcasting. His investigative reporting on everything from poverty and government corruption to faith and peacekeeping made him the face of public broadcasting for millions of Americans. His friendship with Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis spanned more than three decades and countless campaigns on behalf of New York City. In 1987, along with his wife Judith, Bill raised an umbrella with MAS, Mrs. Onassis, and 800 fellow New Yorkers to protest the proposed Columbus Circle Tower that would have cast a shadow a mile long across Central Park. Sound familiar? That demonstration galvanized MAS as a leading voice in the future of our skyline, a campaign we continue to lead 30 years later through our accidental skyline project. Bill was with us that day in Central Park, and we're delighted to have him celebrating with us here tonight. Please welcome Bill Moyers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina, for that very generous introduction, and thank you for that very generous welcome. I, I don't deserve them, but I have arthritis, and I don't deserve that either. <laughs> uh, I also have glasses I can't see through, because a week ago I had some corrective surgery for uh, a vision problem that didn't go quite well, and, um, and my glasses you saw me with for 44 years on the air don't work anymore. So these I actually had back in the Kennedy Johnson administration, <laughs> and I think they may be very appropriate. I am delighted, you'll have to excuse me because you won't recognize me when I put these on. People are always coming up, they used to come up and say, I know you, who are you? Now, since I retired last year, they come up and say, I know you, who were you? And uh, so I'm okay with these glasses. Now I am, after all, a journalist. One of those people George Bernard Shaw said could not distinguish between a bicycle accident and the collapse of civilization. Uh, I prefer to say that we journalists are merely beachcombers on the shores of other people's knowledge and other people's experience. I once taped a conversation with the literary critic George Steiner in which he compared the critic to a tiny pilot fish in which preparing the way for the giant creative specimens. The role is very exciting, he said, but distinctly minor. 
So it is with journalists, and tonight I'm merely preparing the way for a greater specimen. Thanks to all of you who have gathered here to honor the indispensable Municipal Arts Society and the indefatigable Mr. Vanden Heuvel, who will receive the inestimable medal named after the indescribable Jacqueline <laughs> Kennedy Onassis. My own life, my own life has been touched by all of them. I met Jackie Kennedy during the campaign of 1960, immediately after the convention in Los Angeles. LBJ, with a small group of us, flew uh, to Massachusetts, Kennebunk, Kennebunk, so that he and JFK could map their strategy. The two candidates walked the beach for two or three hours and about 20 yards behind, I walked the bench with Mrs. Kennedy. I had by far the greatest time that day. When I moved to New York in 1967, she became my editor at Doubleday. It was her idea to publish a book based on the conversations that I did at George Lucas' Skywalker Ranch with Joseph Campbell on the power of myth. She turned it into a bestseller, along with a book we did together on poetry, The Language of Life, and a book about the impact of emotions on health called Healing and the Mind. She said to me, poetry and emotions I know about. We did, as Gina said, march side by side in Central Park with Kent Barwick under the banner of the Municipal Art Society in that famous Stand Against the Shadows demonstration in 1987. We didn't win the war, but we did win the battle. And the sunlight, air, and space of our commons got a measure of reprieve from the assault on Central Park. We were asked by a reporter, why are you doing this? The Gulf and Western Building stands there. Other tall buildings march along Central Park West and Central Park South. What harm is there in one more? Jackie and I said in response at that press conference that more of the same is not always better. That the last load that snaps the pylon of the bridge is of a different order from the first weight to tax it. The first building on the block does not mean that a second, third, and fourth can be as welcome with the same alacrity or reward. The first change may be welcome, the second understandable, if annoying, the last one fatal. How much weight can a bridge stand? So we ask, what kind of change is it that robs children of sunlight in the playground? that steals half an hour from a short winter's day, that throws a manufactured cloud across a resurrected spring as we are coaxed from our long hibernation. When is enough enough? And what if we don't draw the line before drawing the line no longer matters? So we raised our umbrellas more or less a thousand strong, and spread around Columbus Circle and across the park. It was a formidable sight and a strong message to owners and developers, officials and unions. If you consider New York a place to live in and not just a rock to build upon, if you care what is happening to its human scale, to the air, the sun, the space that nurture us, if you want to guard this precious piece of our common wealth, and if you care that the only flag now flying above the city is a price tag, then let's declare that some things are not for sale. We. We won a reprieve, as I say, with that fight, but only a reprieve. The monsters kept coming. All things are for sale when the top price is the bottom line. 
And the ill-conceived tower that we successfully defeated on Columbus Circle that year would today be dwarfed by the skyscrapers going up on Central Park South, going up as we saw in the photo. Going up, I must add, largely exempt from the public review process, silencing the voice of people keeping us in the dark. The towering wall rising against the skyline encroaches upon the island's last large central open space, increases the noise and the tumult below. I know my office is on West 57th and amounts, amounts to thievery from the very soul of hospitality to human senses that make a city more than a marketplace. I would be tempted to give up. I think most of us would be tempted to give up if there were no one who still believes in a confident future and gets up every morning to try to bring it about. Jackie Onassis had that effect on me. Kent Barrick and the Municipal Arts Society did too. And the man we honor tonight, William J. Vanden Heuvel, Bill Vanden Heuvel, who doesn't really know why he is such a hero to me. Our paths have crisscrossed for decades now. When I find myself looking down, I find myself often looking at his tracks. He's moved on, but I'm coming behind him. And they always lead in a good direction, through a good experience, to a good place and cause. The great progressive of a century ago, William La Follette, described democracy as a life requiring constant struggle. This bill, progressive like La Follette, seems never to have to contemplate it retiring from that life. He reminds me of the fellow who sees a fight halfway down the block and rushes up to the crowd around it and says, is this a private fight or can anybody get into it? <laughs> it seems to me that that's what democracy means to Bill. A public fight for the common good always conducted fairly. He was there with Jackie and you in the fight to save Grand Central Station. And that little plot of inspiration and illumination at the tip of Roosevelt Island, we owe that to Bill's vision, fortitude, and persistence in the campaign he waged 40 years to create a memorial to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Thinking about tonight, when I didn't have glasses and was waiting for the light, thinking about tonight, I realized that of the many things that I admire about this man, I most revere his belief in the power of memory, of a usable past. The legacy, say, of a Roosevelt to which Bill has been so committed. For reasons you'll understand, I've thought a lot lately about the speech of the poet Ceslo Milos in 1980 when he accepted the Nobel Prize for Literature. He said, our planet that gets smaller every year with its fantastic proliferation of mass media is witnessing a process that escapes definition, a refusal to remember a refusal to remember. When inconvenient facts are simply made to disappear, as George Orwell told us, history has stopped. And people are at the mercy of demagogues because there is nothing against which to measure what they're told today. So thank you, Bill. Thanks for living as if memory really matters, because it does. Thank you for the legacy you have served and for all you have done to remind us, as Henry David Thoreau said, to affirm, to affirm the quality of the day is the highest of the arts. And you, my friend and hero, have surely done that. 
come up and receive this award. I wish she were here to give this to you. And in some sense, she is the 2016 Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Medal goes to where it belongs. Thank you. Bill, thank you for those extraordinary words and that message to everyone here tonight. What has been said is, means so much to me, and I'm very grateful. Uh, first, let me begin by thanking Matilda Cuomo for being here tonight, the widow of a great governor, mother of a great governor. And let me thank my beautiful wife for being here, as she always is, Melinda. And my extraordinary children, who've outgrown me in every direction. <laughs> Katrina and Wendy, Ashley and John. And I'm going to just say a few words, if I may. But unlike Bill, I take my glasses off to read. He puts them on. In the tragic days of November, 1963, Bill Moyers was the bridge between the administrations of John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. He was one of the few men trusted by both of them, but he was also trusted by everyone. With their work, Bill and Judith M Moyers have created the curriculum of liberal democracy. And I'm honored by this award this evening, but I'm doubly honored that it was presented to me by Bill Moyers. A short story. In the Watergate scandals, the country had experienced the trauma of the resignation of a president. A massive corruption of values had been revealed. And at the election season approach, I was part of a self-appointed group we studied the question of who would be the best candidate to put the country back together again. I believed that the country would respond to an outsider, someone out of Washington, that would respond to a person of independence who had scars of political battle but had survived intact. I thought America would turn to a man of faith to reaffirm American values of democracy and decency who represented a passion for peace, who understood power, a person who witnessed the tragedy of the Vietnam War, a person who could not be intimidated or morally corrupted by the White House and its magnetic attractions. So in 1975, I invited Bill Moyers to lunch, and I urged him to make himself available as a candidate for President of the United States. He was the person who fit the profile. And for good and sufficient reason, he said no. <laughs> I've always regretted that decision by Bill Moyers. Bill Moyers would have been a great president. By the way, the next person on my list was a relatively unknown former governor of Georgia, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> so we weren't that far off the mark, and I was sure I was right about Bill. The mission of the Municipal Arts Society is to preserve and enhance the urban character of the greatest city in the world. The successful fulfillment of that mission 
has required it to be the conscience of New York, to be the monitor of its growth, the preservator of its history, traditions and treasures. It had to preach and teach the gospel of urban planning and to involve the many communities of New York in defining its future so that our diversity always remains our strength. We thank Fred Eisman and his predecessors and his fellow directors for their significant contribution to this important mission. Fred's a man of many seasons. He's a taskmaster with an artist's temperament and the determination to see a job to his fulfillment. As a determined and forceful leader, he will rally the forces of urban planners, the architects, the elected officials, the developers, the good citizens, the volunteers who are necessary so that the magic of your success continues. We also salute Gina Polara as the new president of the Municipal Art Society. <laughs> Gina was an indispensable partner in building the Four Freedoms Park. She's a person of principle, courage, a willingness to do battle for the public good. She's a tireless worker capable of confronting the turbulence and challenge of our urban society. She has the creative strength needed to do this job. She was the guardian of the Louis Kahn legacy regarding the park. Gina never faltered in that commitment. And she's a lot of fun to work with, especially if you agree with her. <laughs> the preservation of Grand Central Terminal is but one example of the work of the Municipal Arts Society, but an example that reminds us every day of the necessity to have a watchdog at the gates to save who we are. The award carries the name of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Her recruitment to the Municipal Arts Society was a masterstroke. We remember Jackie this evening. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy became the First Lady of the United States at the age of 31. She had a devotion to all things beautiful. But Jackie's greatest gift to our country was the unimagined strength that she shared with each of us after the death of the President. We saw and felt her courage and her incredible discipline. Jacqueline Kennedy held us together, a nation with a broken heart. But led by her majestic courage, we were able to renew our commitment to tomorrow. In 1975, Jackie, once more living among us New Yorkers, became a public voice for MAS, a responsibility she took very seriously, and it meant so much to her. I accept the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Medal on behalf of all of those who participated in creating the Four Freedoms Park. Barbara Shattuck Cohn is now chair of the Conservancy, which manages the park. Also here this evening is Sally Menard, and the president and CEO, with who totally directs the operations. The honor roll is led by Alpha Wood Foundation and its founder, Fred Eichner, a man, a visionary, who has deeply affected America's cultural landscape and truly made the Four Freedoms Park possible. Reed and Jade Ruman, who understood the significance of the park, and gave crucial leadership from the very beginning. I want to thank the children of Louis Kahn, Sue Ann, Nathaniel, and Alexandra, for their fidelity to their father's work. And we thank Nathaniel especially for his extraordinary video of his father's life, which won national honors and brought us supporters from all over the world. There was always agreement that this memorial to Franklin Roosevelt would be called the Four Freedoms Park. The Four Freedoms brought the past and the present together. 
They were the essence of the speech that Franklin Roosevelt gave on January 6, 1941, when the world was beset by war and Nazi oppression, and every tenet of democracy was threatened and ridiculed. On that day, President Roosevelt gave us a vision of the world that would be worthy of our civilization. He spoke simply and eloquently of a nation dedicated to freedom of speech and expression, the best defense against the corruption of democracy, of freedom of worship, our shield against the forces of bigotry and intolerance and fanaticism, freedom from want, a commitment to erasing hunger and poverty and pestilence from the earth, freedom from fear, a freedom dependent on collective security, a concept carried forward with our leadership in the United Nations. Franklin Roosevelt wanted not only his countrymen, but every nation in the world to understand that the four freedoms justified the battle, made worthy the sacrifice, and made essential the victory. Winston Churchill once said of Franklin Roosevelt that he was the greatest man he'd ever known. Franklin Roosevelt was the voice of the people of the United States during the most difficult crises of the 20th century. He led America out of the despair of the Great Depression. He led us to victory in World War II. Four times he was elected President of the United States. By temperament and by talent, by energy and instinct, Franklin Roosevelt was ready to the challenges that confronted him. He was a breath of fresh air in our political life, so vital, so confident, optimistic, so warm, so good-humored. He was also a man of incomparable personal courage. At the age of 39, he had been stricken by infantile paralysis. His family and friends despaired of his recovery, but he accepted the devastating challenge, and with infinite patience, he learned to move again, to stand again, relying upon the physical support of others, never giving in to despair or to self-pity. And just 12 years after he was stricken, he was elected president of a country itself paralyzed and by the most fearful economic depression of our history. He replaced fear with faith, transforming our government into an active instrument of social justice. It was a time when heroes were possible, when idealism was admired, when public service was the highest calling. Franklin Roosevelt made America the arsenal of democracy. He was the commander in chief of the greatest military force ever assembled. He crafted the victorious alliance that won the war. He was the father of the nuclear age and he guided the blueprint for the world that was to follow, including his vision for the United Nations. Almost 550,000 visitors from all over the world have come to the park. They have come to share a vision that brings yesterday and tomorrow together, to tell their children stories about the history of our country and those who have led us, to watch the river, to see the ocean, perhaps even to subdue the turbulence of their lives. Franklin Roosevelt once said that when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. <laughs> the Four Freedoms, the Four Freedom Park, is a great place to hang on. The legacy of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt will be a major battlefield in the months ahead. We are very proud that the battle of this presidential year began almost a year ago in Fort Freedoms Park when a glass ceiling was broken, as it was again last night, by the person who deserved it. We are ready for this battle, and we will win it if we understand and we're faithful to the four freedoms.
This republic will endure, said Franklin Roosevelt, as it has endured. But it must endure under the leadership that understands our Constitution and is prepared to protect our values and that cherishes our leadership in the world today. Thank you for this award. Thank you for your devotion to our beautiful New York. And go to the Four Freedoms Park. Feel the wind and the rain. Embrace the sun and the shadows. And hear this message. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. And happy days are here again. Thank you.